Hello uh, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming out this evening. My name is Jim Ramsey. I'm the head of adult services here at the Middleton Public Library, so that just means that I'm in charge of all of the classes, events, programs, uh, workshops, and things like that for adults here at the library. So again, welcome and thank you for coming out. It's wonderful to see so many of you here uh, this evening. Um, this is the final lecture of 2017 in a series that we here at the library are calling Scholar for Life. Um, it is a series uh, that's been going on since um, February of 2016, in which we invite uh, great professors, researchers, and academics to the library to share a lecture on their area of expertise. Uh, when I first conceived of this series two years, about two years ago now, um, my intention was to represent a wide variety of um, academic disciplines um, and, and areas. So uh, since the series began in February 2016, we've had mathematicians, historians, philosophers, astronomers, engineers, uh, just to name a few. Um, I can't mention any names uh, because nothing is finalized, but I, I can say I'm very excited about next year, and I think you're going to be very pleased with the roster of speakers that we have uh, for 2018. So, um, again, thank you for, for coming out, and thank you for supporting this series in particular. Um, this has been something of a passion project of mine, and um, I, to see the response it has, been, uh, has been very gratifying. So. Uh, this series is made possible by a collaboration between the Middleton Public Library and the UW Speakers Bureau. Uh, Gwen Drury and her staff, her small staff at the uh, Speakers Bureau, uh, have been enthusiastic partners with the library from the very beginning. Their commitment to uh, bringing the benefits of our great university to all the people of Wisconsin shines through in all the work that they do. Uh, this lecture series, Scholar for Life, takes the Wisconsin idea as its starting point. Uh, the aim is to promote lifelong learning, intellectual curiosity, and engagement between academics and the community as a whole. Uh, this talk tonight is brought to us by a unique four-way partnership uh, that really reflects the spirit of the Wisconsin idea. The first partner is the library, of course, uh, we're the venue. Um, the second partner is UW-Madison Speakers Bureau. They handle the logistics, um, uh, con contacting and um, working with the speakers um, to secure a date and a time. Um, uh, I want to mention again, Gwen Drury, she's here uh, tonight. I, don't, I won't single her out, um, but uh, she's done a fantastic, no, I will. Stand up. Sorry, there she is. I... So, uh, the, again, the, the uh, UW Speakers Bureau has done a fantastic job um, uh, coordinating all of these speakers. The third partner um, in this four-way partnership is, of course, Dr. Dunn, who I'd like to note with great appreciation is volunteering his time to be here tonight and come to speak with us. Finally, Dr. Sure. Uh, finally, uh, and not the least, uh, the fourth element of this is all of you. Um, everyone in the audience uh, contributes uh, by actively engaging with our speaker at events like this. And there will be time, um, 10, 15 minutes or so at the end uh, for Q&A. Um, also, I want to mention this lecture is part of the Wisconsin Science Festival. Now in its seventh year, um, it's an annual festival, of course, uh, celebrating the sciences and promoting the sciences throughout Wisconsin. Uh, this Wisconsin Science Festival runs today, uh, November 2nd through the 5th. There are events all over the state, um, many of them uh, in this part of the state. Uh, you can uh, check that out at wisconsinsciencefest.org. Uh, the Wisconsin Science Festival is made possible by UW-Madison, the Morgridge Institute for Research, and the UW Alumni Foundation. Finally, I'm almost done. Finally. I would be remiss if I did not mention our wonderful Friends organization, the Friends of the Middleton Public Library. How many of you here are members of the Friends of the Middleton Public Library? Excellent, excellent. I'm here to tell you that anybody can be a friend of the Middleton Public Library. You don't even have to live in Middleton. Uh, the Friends support all of the programming that we do here at the library, from uh, programs for very little kids all the way up to... Uh, very big kids. So um, there's information on how to join the friends if you're interested, and there's also a little box um, that you'll see on your way out. There's no obligation. Uh, programs and events here will always be free. 
Um, but a lot of people have asked me in the past about how they can contribute and uh, contribute to programming here at the library, and that, that's one way you can do that. Okay, so now enough out of me. Allow me to introduce tonight's speaker. Our guest this evening earned his PhD at Harvard University, currently holds the Distinguished Chair in Contemplative Humanities, a newly endowed position created through the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He also holds a co-appointment in the new Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. His work focuses on Buddhist philosophy and contemplative practice, especially in dialogue with cognitive science and psychology. His publications appear in venues ranging across both the humanities and the sciences. And they include works on Buddhist philosophy, contemplative practice, and their interpretation within scientific contexts. Dr. Dunn speaks in both academic and public contexts, and he occasionally teaches for Buddhist communities, most notably at the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe. In addition to serving as a faculty member for the Center for Healthy Minds, he's a fellow of the Mind and Life Institute, where he has previously served on the board of directors. He also serves as an academic advisor for the Ranjung Yeshe Institute. Please join me in welcoming John Dunn. Thank you very much, Jim. That's, uh, I appreciate that introduction, uh, and I want to thank you and, and the friends of Middleton Library and the library itself for making this possible, and Gwen for all of her work and facilitating everything. It's a real pleasure to be here. I think it's you know one of the things I really like about teaching in a public university is exactly this type of opportunity. It's uh, more than simply getting out there in the public, so to speak. It's also encountering a different way of thinking about the same kind of stuff that we do. Being able to speak with you about it, to get your reaction, to see, see if it makes sense for you is actually very important for me in my own research. Some of my own research gets pretty technical and complicated, and I'll try not to get too technical and complicated tonight, although I'm sure many of you could handle it just fine. But uh, I am very curious to see if what I say tonight can make sense to you, even though it is based upon some pretty long-term research. So let me begin by saying that I am from the Center for Healthy Minds. This is a center that was established in 2008 by uh, Dr. Richard J. Davidson, who himself actually created the endowed chair that I now hold. And the, and the mission of our center, as you can see, is to cult cultivate well-being and release suffering through a scientific understanding of the mind. Now, as it turns out, I'm sure you're all familiar with the old notion of suffering. It turns out there are many different kinds of suffering. And one particular kind of suffering that I'd like to point you to is something that in the Buddhist traditions is articulated as the second arrow. And this is actually a piece that came out a couple of years ago in our discovery section from the College of Arts and Sciences uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Wisconsin State Journal, and you can find this article online. It's about this idea, this Buddhist idea of the second arrow. And uh, that is an idea that actually has become very important, as you will see, in the way in which we use mindfulness for clinical contexts. So here's the idea. The story goes is there's a fellow walking through the forest, and he gets shot by an arrow. And his friends come running over and say, uh, what happened to you? What happened? And he says, oh, I got shot by an arrow. It feels terrible. Look at all the pain that's happening to me. Why me? Why did I get shot by this arrow? It'll never end, the pain. That attitude, whoops. <laughs> that's my own second arrow. <laughs> so hopefully I'm not shooting it right now, but I might be. That attitude is precisely itself the second arrow. The attitude that one term we use for this catastrophizes the experience of pain. So that one is experiencing in the moment a terrible sensation, maybe an almost unbearable sensation, and then what comes with it is a mental experience. So one way of articulating this by someone named John Kabat-Zinn, if you'll hear more about it in a moment, is to say that when we shoot the second arrow at ourselves, what we're doing is we're heaping suffering on top of the pain. So we're experiencing our pain, and then we're adding suffering on top of it. That second arrow is mental suffering. It's 
mental pain. It's the way in which we interpret our experience. Now, there's some very good reasons why this can happen to us. You know, we could uh, experience an accident, or we could be in severe pain. In some ways, it seems quite reasonable for us to have some kind of a mental reaction to it. But sometimes, actually, we don't do this because we're in pain physically. And I want to demonstrate what I'm talking about by giving you a particular kind of example of an amazing capacity that we all have. The, we humans have an amazing capacity that's connected to our amazing brains. And let's, let's have you try it out here. Make use of this amazing capacity that you have. So what I'd like you to do, and apologies to those of you that don't like strawberries, I'd like you to visualize in your mind, you can close your eyes if you want, whatever you like, I would like you to visualize a beautiful bowl of strawberries glistening in the sun, freshly washed, organic, straight from Whole Foods. <laughs> Maybe there's a bowl of chocolate sauce for dipping nearby. Right? It's just waiting to be picked up and eaten. So let me ask you, how many of you, your mouth is watering? Is anyone's mouth watering? Yes? Right? My, actually, mine is. Um, so just by thinking about food, you can make your mouth water. Now, here's the thing about that strawberry. That's a mental strawberry. You can't eat it. Right? You can't take a mental strawberry and put it in your mouth. And yet, the very thought of a strawberry has the capacity to cause a reaction in the body. And this is because one of the ways we talk about this in the cognitive scientific context is what we called embodied cognition or grounded cognition. And at least some forms of human cognition involve what are essentially running a kind, a little simulation. It's as if we're sort of living in our own movie sometimes. We may not even notice it. It may be very short term. It may not be very obvious in your experience. But there are ways in which, especially when we're reflecting on the past or planning the future, we actually tend to run small embodied simulations. And in those embodied simulations, we experience a kind of mental reality that we take as real. So let me, let me try to describe this a little bit better by giving you a story about my friend, Ngawan Togme. So Ngawan Togme is a Tibetan man. He, he came to the United States in the 90s after I met him in India when I was doing uh, my doctoral research. We became very good friends, and he ended up at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where he's a librarian. And when he first got there, the graduate students, you know, sort of to welcome him, took him out to dinner and, you know, pizza and a movie, basically. So the movie that they decided to see was Jurassic Park. <laughs> and uh, Togme, you know, who was born in a very remote region and uh, really hadn't seen that many movies at all, quite honestly, is enjoying the movie for a little while. And, you know, it's really, he's fascinated, actually. And then the dinosaurs kind of start to do their thing. And some of you may remember that the thing that they do is not very nice. And at a certain point, Togme starts to scream. And at first they thought, oh, he's just one of those people he likes to scream at scary movies. He didn't stop screaming. So why is that? Because Togme was experiencing the movie as real. He'd never seen a computer graphic generated movie before. He thought it was, you know, CNN, like he was seeing newsreel, so to speak. This was actually happening somehow. So he experienced that movie as a reality. And as you can imagine, when we do that ourselves with, for example, the short simulation we run about the stressful conversation we're going to have tomorrow. If I'm going to be going into a meeting and I know that there's going to be some difficult issues, as I'm planning what I'm going to do, I am also can be, in a sense, kind of living in a little simulation. And if I have a relationship to that simulation such that I think it is real, I'm going to have a bodily stress reaction, what we call a fight or flight reaction, where my body gets ready to defend itself and especially gets ready to be wounded. And as part of that process, what happens is 
when we get into this stress response, as a result simply of thinking about a difficult conversation, we actually start to flood our system with various kinds of hormones, such as cytokines, that are designed to help us respond to an injury. In short, what we have is an inflammatory response. When we have this stress response, we almost always have an inflammatory response. And of course, if we're about to be wounded in a fight, that's a good thing. If I'm sitting on my couch thinking about some difficult conversation, and I do that again and again and again every day, that's not such a good thing. And we know this, we've actually known this for quite a while. This appeared in Nature Reviews on Immunology in 2005. And what uh, Glazer and Glazer discuss here, or Glazer and Kiko Glazer discuss here, actually is only more known now, only more established by empirical evidence. As they say, stressors can increase susceptibility to infectious agents, influence the severity of infectious disease, diminish the strength of immune responses to vaccines, reactivate latent herpes viruses, and slow wound healing. Moreover, stressful events and the distress they evoke can also substantially increase the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are associated with a spectrum of age-related diseases. That's that inflammatory response. Accordingly, stress-related dysregulation might be one core mechanism behind a diverse set of health risks. And in particular, as they discussed there, and as we've discovered, some of those health risks are, for example, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, ex eczema, fibromyalgia. These are diseases that may be connected to sort of long-term inflammatory responses. Some of those responses are not the result of stress, but stress can definitely exacerbate those responses. And interestingly, actually, there are also psychological conditions that appear to be connected to this inflammatory response. So that when we have an excess of inflammation, we're much more likely, we have a greater tendency toward depression or even major depressive disorder and anxiety, whether it's subclinical or actual clinical anxiety. So living in these kinds of stressful situations can be very destructive, actually, for one's health. They can certainly add to the wear and tear on one's mind and body. Some of these are actual simulations, as I say, as we were simply sitting on the couch thinking about what's going to happen. And some of them are also in interpersonal reactions, in interpersonal actions, relationships. So uh, Glazer and Kiko Glazer themselves, for example, have done some work. I always like to show this article, some work on hostile marital interactions. Not that any of you would know anything about those. Uh, my wife is sitting right here, so I'm, I'm obviously... Uh, and uh, part of what they showed is that you have this, you can have this same kind of stress response just from a conversation, right? Or even from thinking about a conversation. And as one of the things that you see here is, couples blister wounds healed more slowly, and local cytokine production was lower at wound sites following marital conflicts. So if you have a bad argument and you stab your, no, never mind, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> But what this shows is actually that even wound healing can be affected by this kind of a stress response. Now, importantly, there's something we can do about this. And mindfulness is one way that we can do something about it. There are actually many things that we could do, but mindfulness actually can be very helpful here. There's, however, an issue you could say with mindfulness. One of them is, of course, that it's become, you probably, who's heard of mindfulness before? Yes, I'm not too surprised. And who's actually practiced a little mindfulness here and there? Oh, wow, well, okay. Well, why am I giving this talk? <laughs> uh, so you probably maybe even seen this cover, right? What you didn't know is if you meditate mindfulness long enough, eventually you will turn into a beautiful blonde woman. <laughs> this... Uh, what this cover sort of points to is a certain kind of hype in a way, right, that has been surrounding mindfulness. And we need to be careful about the claims that we make about the effects of mindfulness. And that has led many of us to really try to focus on the ways, the specific styles of mindfulness that seem to be clinically helpful. There actually are many different kinds of mindfulness, but there are some that have been really studied clinically, even by our own Center for Healthy Minds, and the various scientists connected to our center and our collaborators. And in particular, I'm thinking of this style that's articulated in the book Full Catastrophe Living by this man, John Kabat-Zinn. 
its first edition was in 1991, and it's based upon the mindfulness, or it is actually an articulation of the mindfulness, you probably can't read this, but it says, the mindfulness-based stress reduction program that was developed at the UMass Medical School starting in 1981. So has anyone here actually taken a mindfulness-based stress reduction course? Okay, yeah, MBSR. So you probably know quite a lot about how my MBSR works, I hope. I've actually been trained by John Kabat-Zinn in MBSR, and I've known John for a very long time. In fact, this picture, <laughs> this picture is from, I think, 2005, I believe, and that's Richie Davidson, the founder of our center. There's John and myself in what I traditionally at these Mind and Life Summer Research Institutes, I used to wear these uh, Hawaiian shirts, but um, they now cause marital hostile conflict, so uh, <laughs> I don't wear them anymore. And I was uh, fortunate this summer, I was teaching at a retreat uh, with John, uh, a retreat being led by a, a Tibetan teacher, and the two of us were there. And I got to reconnect very nicely with John this summer. The, actually, a lot of the time that I've spent with John has been very valuable for me in terms of my research and in really, uh, how, to, how to say, to sort of promote a certain sense of the importance of looking into the effects of mindfulness, in part because of the hype. And that led, led me and a number of my colleagues, especially my colleague from the Center for Healthy Minds, Antoine Lutz, who is also now at INSERM, a lab in Lyon, France, uh, Antoine, who was just here uh, last week, actually led us in the writing of this article that was an attempt, and I realize it's got a very long and fancy name, uh, it was an attempt to come up with an account of that would, a tool that would enable us to understand various styles of mindfulness and what is happening when we engage in mindfulness practice. So, the first part of this article is all about the phenomenology of mindfulness. What is it like to practice mindfulness? How does mindfulness actually work in one's experience? And then the second part of the article looks at those various features that we, tr that we postulate as being the core features of mindfulness and tries to understand how they might be realized in brain function. In order to articulate this, we actually we, we designed what we call the cube. And I, I'm going to show this to you at the risk of it being a little bit complicated. This is actually a way, what we have are three main dimensions, and then four secondary dimensions. And these three main dimensions are meta-awareness, object orientation, and de-reification. And we can plot a location in the cube that then can be qualified by these other four dimensions, secondary dimensions, that describes a particular kind of practice. Right? Now, I'm not going to go into this. It's, I, I'm sure it's kind of a fascinating diagram, and I'm showing it in part because I'd be happy to make the article available to you. Especially those of you that have practiced mindfulness might find it interesting to look at an analysis of how mindfulness works in experience that you probably have never encountered before. But of these various dimensions, there are two that are, seem especially important for clinical effects. And these two are definitely trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, but they may also be trained by many other styles of mindfulness. And again, there are many different styles. And the two features are dereification and meta-awareness. So what I'm going to do is talk about these two features of mindfulness for the next 20 minutes, perhaps, and then we'll take some questions. These two aspects of mindfulness. Both of them, and indeed mindfulness in general, perhaps, is really in a way about a key aspect of our experience. And you could say that mindfulness, especially as it is, as it is taught in mindfulness-based stress reduction, which emerges from Buddhist traditions, various Buddhist traditions, also draws on some other traditions, including, for example, Hinduism and Christianity and Sufism. So it draws on various traditions. It's, it's not just Buddhism. But one, a couple of features that it picks up from Buddhism are exactly these two, meta-awareness and dereification. And you could say that both of these are about another aspect of experience, which is the way in which we relate to the contents of our experience. Not what the contents are, but the way in which we are relating to the contents of our experience. Whether that experience is an emotion, another person, a piece of food, or what have you. 
And in the Buddhist world, which is also picked up by John Kabat-Zinn, the way that this is articulated is that there's a kind of dysfunctional way of relating, which is actually a kind of metaphor, a physical metaphor. It's the metaphor of grasping, of graha in Sanskrit, or dzimba in Tibetan, which are the two languages that uh, we draw on especially for this paper. So when we're grasping, you can also say that we're fixating on a content. We're actually so fixated on a content that we may not even be aware of the way we're relating to that content. In a sense, we are fused with that content, fused with that experience. So for example, when my friend Tobme was in that movie watching it, he was completely absorbed and fused in the experience of Jurassic Park. He was grasping to the reality of that movie. So de-reification is one of the two features that I mentioned to you. What is it? It's something that really is about letting go. It's about not fixating, not grasping. And let me give you a very simple example, or even a little exercise. If you've ever seen this picture before, please don't give it away. So let me ask you... Uh, what is this? Anyone? A pipe? Can I hear the pipe? Any other answers? Well, some of you may know that this is from the, the surrealist artist Magritte. And what Magritte says, ceci n'est pas une pipe, which means this is not a pipe. <laughs> and it isn't a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. <laughs> right? That moment is de-reification. Simply realizing that the simulation that you're in, hopefully, you know, the con when you're thinking about the meeting tomorrow, it doesn't look like this. But when you're running your little simulation about a difficult meeting or a difficult conversation, that the thoughts that you're having as you're doing that are not reality. Right? The thought of a strawberry is not a strawberry. And even when you are with someone in a relationship now, not planning, but actually in a relationship in the moment, the thoughts that we have about other people are not what the other people are. Right? Many, I'm sure many of you have been in conversations, perhaps with your spouses, in which it seems like the other person doesn't hear you at all. They're so caught up in what they think you're saying that they're not actually listening to what you're actually saying. And not that I've ever done that, am I there? <laughs> so that also can be a moment for de reification That I have an idea about what's happening, what this person is saying, what they're feeling, and I get caught in my idea of the other person instead of actually being with that other person in a mindful way. So de reification is, in a sense, seeing through the story that we're telling, whether it's a story we're telling while sitting on the couch worrying about a difficult conversation, or a story we're even telling right now when we're in relationship with another person. So let's do a, a brief exercise just to see whether you can do this, okay? Uh, and you can use the image, or you can do this with your mind, Let's, let's visualize, let's really do a great strawberry visualization job now, right? Maybe with eyes closed or looking at the image, just try to see that beautiful bowl of strawberries. The smell is wafting. They just want to be eaten, ready to go. And now that's a thought. Look at the thought. So what happens when you look at the thought of the strawberry? Anybody? Anyone? It's disappointing. What else? It disappeared. Does anyone else? Did it disappear for anybody else? Did it actually get really hard to keep the thought going? When, now, there's a reason for that. If I think it's a strawberry, then I, I, have, I want it. It's important to me. It's something I will pay attention to. And this is connected to theories of attention, where we don't just randomly pay attention to stuff. 
We pay attention to what is salient to us, what is important to us, what is either good for us or bad for us, what we want or what we want to avoid. So when something is important, we pay attention. A strawberry is, like, I like strawberries, so if I'm thinking of a strawberry and I think my thought is real, I'm going to keep paying attention. When it becomes a thought, when I see it as a thought, it goes poof. Why? Because I have plenty of thoughts. I don't need more. Right? I can't eat my thoughts. I'm not interested in my thoughts. Right? I can be interested in my thoughts as thoughts, of course, in a different context. But when what I want is a strawberry, and you say, well, that's not a strawberry. It's just a picture of a strawberry. Then I stop paying attention. I feel a little disappointment, maybe. Like, but it does, very interestingly, tend to go poof. In the Tibetan world, we call this the, the Nantok Rangjul, which means the self-liberation of thoughts. Simply recognizing the thought of a thought enables it to go poof. It dissipates. And that can be very powerful. And it's not always easy to do. It can be, however, very powerful, especially when we're kind of caught and fixated on our thoughts, when we're grasping very strongly. And then we can come back to, so when Tome was at the movie, it's not like he just stopped watching. He was then able, once they told him, he did stop screaming when they explained to him that it was computer-generated graphics. He did stop. And he actually kind of enjoyed it after that. And he was able to be with the movie and even get excited and feel emotions, but not be totally fused and fixated in the horror, so to speak. So that's what we can also do with food, and we can do that with other experiences as well. And in fact, we even know this scientifically from, through an empirical study by my friend uh, Larry Barslow. And Larry Barslow, my former colleague at Emory University, is now University of Glasgow, and Esther Papies. Uh, Larry and Esther did some great work actually specifically on food and demonstrated how this capacity for dereification is something that we all have. It turns out to be a capacity also that seems to be very important, not just in mindfulness, but also in cognitive behavior therapy. Because part of cognitive behavior therapy as well is the capacity to drop one interpretation of your life, to drop one story, and maybe find a more reasonable story. The capacity to drop that story is dereification. Seeing through the stories we tell about ourselves, seeing through the way in which our thoughts present as reality. That doesn't mean not thinking. It means having a different relationship to your thoughts. However, there's an important, another important feature of mindfulness that's really necessary for this, and that's this other one that's represented in our cue, meta-awareness. You need meta-awareness in order to engage in dereification. And let me explain why. Let me tell you, give you a little sense of what meta-awareness. Let's suppose go back here for a second. Let's suppose, you know, we, uh, we decide to go on a camping trip. We're out on the Tibetan Plateau, actually. And uh, how we got there, we won't worry about that. But we're out on the Tibetan Plateau. It's early morning. We're, uh, uh, we get out of the tent and, you know, we sort of walk over to a, an area where we can see this beautiful vista. And then we see this amazing sunrise taken by a very skilled photographer sitting right there, my wife. <laughs> we see this beautiful sunrise, just amazing. And then we turn around and we go back to the tent a couple of minutes later, and I say, as we're boiling up some tea, I say, uh, well, how did you feel when you were looking at the sunrise? Right? I could see that you were completely absorbed in it at the time, like totally absorbed in the sunrise, and just wondering how you felt. Now, when I ask you that question, do you think you have to, you, do you say to me, uh, just a second, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back to the sunrise and I'm going to look at it, and then I'm quickly going to look inside to see how I feel. Or do you already know, even though you were completely absorbed in the sunrise, you also know how you were feeling at the same time, right? So here's another way of talking about it. That's, we're starting to get into meta-awareness. Here's another way of thinking about it. Very simple exercise. I'm going to give you a timestamp. I'm going to make a sound. 
All right, so I just want you to sort of, you can be looking at the screen or at me or what have you. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, that's our time stamp. Now let me just ask you, at that time stamp, do you remember you were looking, right? So uh, were you the one looking or was it somebody else? What is the crazy professor asking? <laughs> Did you, do you, is that a question that you have any difficulty with? Does it seem a little silly? Like you already included in your memory, right, of looking at the screen or looking at me, was your sense of the subjectivity of the I, the, the I as in me, the I looking out, right? But you weren't paying attention to that. Was anyone, while they were looking at the screen, quickly checking to make sure it was them while they were looking? <laughs> Nobody was doing that, right? I mean, actually, in certain psychopathologies, this can be an issue, really. And in certain meditation practices, you try to just, you try to sort of create a sense of like, wait, who's doing the looking here? But in our ordinary state, when I ask you that question, you remember yourself, or whoever that is, as the one see looking. How do you do that? How do you know what your emotions were while you were looking at the sunset? You weren't looking at your emotions, but you know what they were. You weren't looking at your sense of the subjectivity, the one who's looking out, and yet you knew it without a doubt, right? How is that happening? That's happening through what we call meta-awareness. Now, strictly speaking, it's happening through a more basic capacity, which is reflexivity. I'm not going to get into those details. Let's just call it meta-awareness. What does this mean, this meta-awareness? Sometimes it's occurring in this background way, and that's when we tend to call it reflexivity. Like, we're just sort of, all of this information about our body position, about our sense of being the subjectivity, about our location in space and time, all of that is being supplied even while you look at me. So you could be totally focused on the on this screen completely, and yet you know your body position, you know your relative position in space, you don't sort of lose track of whether it's yesterday or today. All of that is maintained. It's being maintained by this background capacity of your consciousness. And that background capacity of our consciousness is what enables us to notice things when we need to, that are not about objects. They're not about what we're experiencing, they're how we're experiencing. So a part of our minds is always doing this. A part of our minds is always presenting to us the quality of our experience. When we get into, let's say, a big argument, hopefully at some point, I notice before I get into the big argument, I will start to notice that I'm getting upset, right? I, I assume this has happened to some of you. You'll be having a conversation, and then at a certain point you kind of notice, oh, I'm starting to get a little heated up here. How do I notice that? I could be checking inward periodically. I might be doing that. But more likely, this kind of aspect of our consciousness suddenly becomes salient to us. We notice it because it's important in the context. Just like if there were a loud sound right now, we would all look over at the loud sound, right? So one of our background tasks is to survive and loud sounds might be dangerous, so that will definitely draw our attention. But otherwise, we're probably not really listening to all the background noises in this room, like the hum of the fan. Also, right now, there's a lot of background information about our own feelings, emotions, and so on that's being presented to us. It's not really relevant, probably, for most of us right now. But it can become relevant. The big problem is that our system is generally really focused on objects, and there's good reasons for that, good evolutionary reasons. That's, you know, to survive, we needed to get stuff and avoid stuff. As social animals, as it turns out, as primates, part of our very, really big brains are probably actually connected to our capacity for social cognition. And that means that we have a lot more meta-awareness probably than many other kinds of, of uh, creatures. 
So even though we're focused on objects most of the time, we humans actually have a little more access to this kind of background than most types of other primates even. And that access to background actually is something that you can train. And that's a good thing, because you need it to do this dereification. Now, dereification is not something that is, uh, how to put it, uh, it's not a new technique, something that you can't already do. Anytime you, you drop a train of thought, anytime you're in the middle of a, let's say you're in the middle of a, uh, of a daydream, you're on the beach in the Bahamas, and then at a certain point you realize, I'm not on the beach in the Bahamas. That's dereification, right? We're all capable of that. But we can also train ourselves to get a little better at it, to not get caught or fixated in our thoughts, in our simulations, or in our, our ideas of other people. In order to do that, however, we have to understand how we are relating to our thoughts, or how we are relating to other people. And that how of the relationship is meta-awareness. So without that capacity, which is trained by mindfulness, especially the style of mindfulness developed by John Kabat-Zinn, that capacity is really crucial for us to be good at be doing dereification. We can do dereification otherwise, but basically we won't even know when to do it if we don't have this meta-awareness capacity. Part of what that means is that to develop meta-awareness, as it turns out, we also have to develop a certain kind of habit of relating to objects in a way that's a little bit less fixated and grasping. Because it seems like, basically, to use kind of brain speak a little bit, we have a certain limited amount of resources for our cognition. You know, some of those resources are literally glucose. And we can use them all up in fixating on objects, or we can try to spare some of our resources to, be, to cultivate more of an awareness of the background. So some of you, when you've done mindfulness meditation, you may have done a kind of mindfulness meditation which is very strongly focused on the object, but you may have also been encouraged to do a kind of mindfulness meditation in mindfulness-based stress reduction, for example, in which you're sort of invited to maybe not even have an object, to just sort of have an open awareness. Or you're on the object, but you're invited to kind of notice the quality of your awareness even while you're on the object. So those ways of training where you're, let's say, for example, you pay attention to the sensations of breathing. That's a standard mindfulness technique. You could do that by really trying to notice every detail. Or you can just let the, breath, the mind ride on the breath, so to speak. And that gives you a lot more resources to start to notice the quality of your experience, even while you're paying attention to the breath. So this is a critical aspect of meta-awareness. If you don't if you get too fixated on objects, too fused with your thoughts, too fused with the out there, so to speak, then it's going to be difficult to train meta-awareness. That's why mindfulness techniques that emphasize the training of meta-awareness often de-emphasize very strong object focus. Now, one of the things about getting more meta-awareness is that it actually gives you what we call more granularity about the cognitive background or the context of your experience. This especially includes your own emotions. So, one way of thinking about people who are alexithymic, who don't, who, who have a lot of trouble reporting on their emotions, may be that they have that they have some issues with meta awareness. They actually don't really, they don't have a good way of noticing their own experience. Maybe they're too fused in objects. It could be one version of alexithymia. So, in order for us to um, in a sense, respond to our emotional states, we need not just a vague sense of what's going on emotionally, it's better if we can have a really finely grained sense. So the more that we can be clear about what's happening to us emotionally, and even move past our stories about what's happening, and actually observe what's happening, the better we have the option, the better the possibility for us to actually change our experience. In other words, meta awareness gives, an, gives us an ability to assess the, our relationships to thoughts, to emotions, to feelings, to what's going on in the present moment, and then, and then perhaps to adopt a different relationship to those thoughts, to those feelings, to those emotions. And that's a lot about, that is a lot of what mindfulness is about, especially 
kind of mindfulness you would learn in mindfulness-based stress reduction. The good news is you can actually develop these capacities. We're quite clear about that. And the even better news is we're starting to make clear exact about how they work. It seems that dereification in particular, as I mentioned to you previously, may be a really critical feature for dealing with certain types of psychological issues. And meta-awareness may be a kind of skill that's great not just for dealing with psychological issues, but it actually may be very healthy for relationships in general. Remember, this is not about kind of turning inward and retracting from the world. It's actually about a having a broader, more open experience of the world itself. So, perhaps one day we'll all be able to uh, go to Tibet together and practice our meta-awareness. I hope. Thank you very much. So, uh, if you turn off your brain, you'll die, so don't do that. Uh, um, unless you can get a different brain. And, no, um, uh, the, uh, and, and here, there certainly are styles where you, like, you really try to kind of stop thoughts, but the style of, uh, of mindfulness that I'm pointing to more here, which is my understanding of mindfulness-based stress reduction style, uh, as I learned it from John, and that's related to other styles of mindfulness that I practice more in Buddhist context. Uh, it's, the point is not to stop the thoughts. It's to have a different relationship to the thoughts. So, you know, if I de-reify my thoughts, so when Tome, you know, is, is, is in the movie theater, the movie keeps going, right? It's just that he now has a different relationship to that movie so that he's not fused, he's not caught in it, he's not fixated on it. So and the same can be true with your thoughts, where you don't really need to stop them. You can just see through. Sometimes, like, you know, if you really, in terms of technique, if you have a thought, this is the exercise we did before, you have a thought, you just notice it and look at it as a thought, it will almost certainly just disappear in most cases. And that's a very specific technique that you can use, but you don't, that requires a certain kind of effort, you don't need to do that all the time. You can instead start to develop a kind of, you know, a stance, a way of relating to thoughts that just loosens your relationship to them so that, in a sense, you have more freedom and are less caught in them. If you do the thing where you actually de-reify the thought and you make it go away, Part of what's really useful about that is it sort of shows you, even if it's a really difficult thought, like you say, oh, it really is just a thought. And that experience then starts to set up this deeper habit of relating to all thoughts differently. Yes, right. So you, you can, it, it's again, in a sense, seeing through the way in which the thoughts represent something. Right? So, you know, if we even look at this picture, on the one hand, it's, uh, it looks like a sunset, but on the other hand, I don't know what I did, but there it is. Uh, or if you go to the, let's find our strawberries a little bit clearer. So, you know, you can see this and say, that's strawberries just like we saw the picture of the pipe, and you said, that's a pipe. Or you can actually just see the colors, the shapes. Right? You can experience that content differently. And you can do that with, your, with your, your feelings, your emotions, and your thoughts as well, not just put them into a category. So that's also an aspect of dereification, like seeing through the categories that we're using for our experience, which opens up other possibilities. That's very interesting with pain, actually. That's just what I was going to ask about. The chronic pain, where what was originally danger signals no longer represent danger, they're useless signals. And that's an active area of research on something. I think I'm familiar with that. Okay, how the brain 
we just, uh, I just, uh, when was it, Monday, right, did a, um, a doctoral defense of, uh, by Joe Vilgos, who's now uh, he's one of our students in the clinical psychology program and uh, a, an advisee of Richard Davidson's, and I was on his dissertation committee. He's now doing his internship at the VA Center in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and Joe's dissertation title was The Second Arrow. And it was all about pain, actually. We have done, we have a couple of publications already out, and he's going to be producing another one. Uh, chronic pain in particular, so we didn't study chronic pain, and we, it's something that I think we will move to. There's a researcher at the University of Utah named Eric Garland, who I've uh, collaborated with a little bit, and we may do some more. And he's been doing some more research on this also with people who have had op opioid addiction. And one of the things about chronic pain is that it's not a danger, but that it often has a very heavy component of the second arrow, where there's a story about the pain that people get stuck in. And, you know, learning how to just move past that story can be very powerful. And then the second, so there's the story about the pain, and then there are, there's, the, there's the experience of the pain can actually kind of be fit into a category so that, you know, for example, if I say, oh, those are just strawberries, then I don't really pay any attention anymore. I've figured it out, there's strawberries, and I'm done. Instead, I can say, well, there's this color, and there's that white glint, and there's those round shapes, and the little yellow dot. I can start to look past my initial categorization. Like, those aren't strawberries, it's, you know, let's just put aside even that it's a picture of strawberries. What are we seeing? Shapes, colors, textures. Right? Some of you have done the raisin exercise, maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the same thing. Like, what's... Stop thinking what we're experiencing. Let's just really see what we're experiencing. When you do that with pain, it can be extremely transformative. And for some of Eric Garland's patients actually start to experience their pain as being not just as almost pleasurable, actually, some of the chronic pain patients. Now, that seems amazing, and he hasn't published that research yet. But I do think that you can develop a different attitude about exactly what is happening in my pain. The problem with chronic pain is it's there all the time, usually, or, or nearly all the time. So, you know, constantly kind of inquiring into it can be exhausting. But a few moments can be, I think, very powerful. Change the story of the pain. Also on the UW Madison campus is the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center focusing upon caregivers and care partners and the stressors that come with that experience. Um, is there any So uh, I, um, we actually have some peripherally uh, Alzheimer's related research on in brain inflammation. Um, and I, I should mention that a couple of my colleagues, uh, uh, Chuck Rezon, uh, who's also a new chair in the center, and uh, Melissa Rosencrantz, a scientist, do a lot of work on this inflammatory, on these inflammatory issues, which may have some relevance to Alzheimer's. But uh, there have been studies on uh, the use of mindfulness for Alzheimer's caregivers that, and for also uh, autistic uh, pa parents of autistic children. And um, uh, for example, Alyssa Apple uh, in, in, at the University of San Francisco has done some work on this, and uh, UC San, uh, San Francisco. And I think the, what it, the indications that, that I recall are that um, Mindfulness can be very helpful for relieving the stress of the caregivers, and that generally, actually, there the, there is a positive response in the one receiving the care as well, because basically there's less stress in the caregiver. So uh, I don't know of anything that's going on here right now with that, but that's a really intriguing idea. There is, of course, the UW Health Mindfulness Center, and some of you have probably done your MBSR course there, maybe. So, really, yeah, the, so that's a place where you can do MBSR, uh, get, take the eight-week MBSR course. We are developing another program called the Healthy Minds Program, which will be an app-based uh, course that will be available in another year or so. Uh, but I think that actually the UW Mindfulness, the UW Health 
mindfulness program may have been doing something with Alzheimer's at one point. I just don't think we did research, but it's a very important area, and some people have done research on that. Yes? So what we're interested, we're, we're really interested in, in the Center for Healthy Minds, and are, we're about well-being, and about, as Richie likes to say, Richie Davidson likes to say, you know, the kind of mantra is, well-being is a skill that you can acquire, you can get better at well-being. And one way of thinking about a critical aspect of well-being is something we call resilience. And you can just kind of generically represent resilient, the way resilience might look if you're measuring some feature of resilience, is that there would be a challenge and the graph would go up of whatever you're measuring, let's say it's for example inflammatory response or amygdala response, and it, the graph goes up and then in people who are resilient, so the one thing is not that would not be healthy is if the graph didn't go up, if you had no response, that means you're blunted in your response to a challenge, and that's actually usually go, uh, comorbid with depression. So we're not asking people to not respond. So they have a response, but then they have a response. But then that response in people who are resilient, they kind of come back to their baseline uh, quite rapidly. And people who are not resilient, who are having issues of one kind or another, they take a lot longer to get back to baseline. So in this kind of a situation, you know, if one gets terrible news, of course, one expects there to be an emotional reaction, you know, maybe tears, whatever it might be. There'll be some kind of a strong reaction. It's not, the point is not to resist that reaction at all. But then there's the, the, the sort of follow-up interpretation, the story you tell now that you've got that information. And one of the skills that is also connected to this it is less in mindfulness, but more in things like cognitive behavior therapy and also in Buddhist practice, is what we call in, this, in the psychological world cognitive reappraisal, which basically means you, you, you have various stories, various ways of interpreting the situation. So if someone gets injured and, uh, you know, like I have a, uh, a close friend gets injured in a car accident, I can fixate on their injuries or I can say, well, they're alive and I'm going to go see them and I'm going to go to the hospital and see what I can do, right? And maybe I can help out the family instead of like, instead of catastrophizing it, even personalizing it, oh, this is terrible, how could this possibly happen, right? So I can choose different kinds of reactions, but that choice depends, maybe requires a little bit of training sometimes, actually. So that one fully experiences an emotion, but then doesn't get caught, doesn't get fixate, doesn't grasp. Time for a couple more. <clears throat> Can we learn reunification uh, through dreams early in life? Because it almost seems to me that it almost would apply when we wake up at, from a nightmare or we're trying to solve a problem. It seems like we're applying this in, a, in, in our sleep much more readily than we do when we're alert and awake during the day. You mean we de-reify in the sleep? De-reify, yeah. Yeah, well, especially lucid dreaming, which is actually, in the Buddhist world, is something you can use to train yourself for this, actually. You learn lucid dreaming so that you get better at de-reifying in general. Lucid dreaming is a very good example of a de like permanently kind of de-reified stance. So you know it's a dream, it seems real, but you know it's a dream. And yes, dreaming can be a way of cultivating this kind of an attitude. One of the things about dereification is that it is clearly really important for a healthy cognitive function, but it's just a normal capacity. It's not something, just like we wake up from a dream, we know it wasn't real. When I'm daydreaming, I know that's not real. But also if I'm trying to figure something out, and uh, you know, like most academics, I tend to perseverate, which is a very nice word that kind of describes what a cat does when a toy gets under the couch, you know. You just keep, the cat doesn't like do any problem solving, it just keeps going like this. 
right? So that's fixation. And that I have a strategy, I'm trying to solve this problem, I'm totally fixated on it, and I can't de-reify. So de-reify is, well, that's one story, I'm going to try a different approach. So it's also connected to creativity, actually, it's and cognitive flexibility. And you could say, like, we have it all the time, we have access to it all the time, but there are maybe times when it's more obvious, like lucid dreaming. Okay, well, I guess one more in the back. Uh, yes, there are. There's a. I'm trying to remember the name of this fellow. Uh, he's at the uh, music school of the University of Michigan. I cannot remember his name, but he has a whole program on. Uh, I think it's really just generally creativity and mindfulness. It's focused on music, and I believe he has a few publications. There are. There's a publication uh, on uh, a kind of what we so in this diagram uh, in the cube. You saw there's actually a reference to two different styles of practice, what we call focused attention, which is where you're really focusing strongly on an object. So this object orientation is high, right? You're really focusing on the object strongly, and then there's what we call open monitoring, the OM, and this is novice and expert. And when you do open monitoring meditation, you, the, the, the style involves really not so much focus on the object, so much more, as you can see in the meta-awareness dimension, much more meta-awareness. And, and there was a study, I think, done in Switzerland that compared these two styles, and, and, and uh, they had some measure of creativity, and they found that this kind of more open style uh, uh, was much more conducive to creativity. So that's the kind of work that we're looking at. You, I think there's... In my mind, uh, it's, you know, I'm not a, uh, I, I've dabbled in poetry and such things, but uh, the, I, my sense of even the appreciation of art requires a kind of meta-awareness, really. And it seems like great artists probably, this is a place where they, they have a real strength. <laughs>